So today's topic is going to be how fast can multiple myeloma progress and what happens biologically when it does. Now, I want to tell you how I got this topic because it's important to me. I reached out into our different Facebook groups. This was before we had started our Connect. So if you know about Connect, it's our new health tree social media platform, but we still have Facebook groups. And I asked in those Facebook groups, for you who are relapsed or refractory or maybe in complete remission, what is something that you want to know? And this was the most popular one. It was how fast can multiple myeloma truly progress? And then another person asked, well, what hap what's happening biologically when it does? So we wanted to tackle this topic. And I just tell you how I got this topic because I want you to know it matters to me. What you want to know, I want to know. I'm your advocate here. I want to get this information as much as you do. So please let me know in that survey, what do you want to know in our relapse refractory chapter? What questions do you want me to ask? I'm here to help. And I want you guys to have answers in your myeloma journey that you're searching for. Okay. So here today to talk to us is Dr. Wong. Now, several of you reached out to me to let me know that Dr. Wong is your physician and that she's amazing. So I have high expectation. No, I'm just kidding. I, I mean, I do, but no pressure, no pressure. Um, Dr. Wong, it's my pleasure to introduce you. She is a blood disease specialist who cares for people with MGUS, smoldering myeloma, multiple myeloma, and amyloidosis. She's designing a clinical trial for a promising new drug to treat multiple myeloma. After graduating from Brown University with a degree in human biology, she earned her medical degree at the University of Massachusetts. She then completed an internal medicine residency followed by a hematology oncology fellowship at Tufts Medical Center. She is a member of the American Society of Hematology and American Society of Clinical Oncology, and she is currently at UCSF, right? I was uh, right. Okay. I said that. And then I was like, wait, what am I wrong? <laughs> well, Dr. Wong, I am so excited to get started and um, really looking forward to just, you know, as we talked about being able to have a discussion, um, I'm going to jump right into it. And then you're welcome to say anything that you would like to. One of the main questions that I hear is, what lab numbers, I, I think the most important thing that we can establish is what actually is a relapse, right? That's a common question that we hear. Mm -hmm. So what lab values or numbers show you that a patient is relapsing and what levels do you start to become concerned within those labs? Yeah, that's a great question. First, I just want to say hello, everybody. And a, you know, um, hello to my patients out there that are listening. And, and for those who are not my patients, I'm so proud of you for engaging with this platform and, and listening to this talk, because I think it really empowers you to figure out what's going on with your labs. Um, so to answer your question, um, you know, uh, during the um, uh, uh, visits with my myeloma patients, we, we checked their uh, myeloma labs. So what does that mean? Um, myeloma labs include a complete blood count and a, um, and a chemistry um, that includes uh, uh, calcium, as well as uh, the, so those are the general labs that does feed into how we think about what's going on with the disease. Uh, they are important. And I'll tell you why in a little bit. And um, and the and the typical uh, classic myeloma labs uh, include um, in serum protein electrophoresis with immunofixation, uh, serum free light chains, and your immunoglobulins. And so this is what's done in the blood. Um, and there are other testing that can be done in the urine and obviously imaging. We can talk about that in a little bit. But these are kind of like the routine labs that we get um, to have an assessment of what's going on. And so these are the uh, labs that we look at. And in terms of you know how we define um, that it, that it, it, the patient is progressing through what we're the patient is on or um, or which basically a lot of people ask me what does that even mean like to progress or or, or to relapse or what does that really mean um, that basically means that based upon these uh, laboratory indicators or clinical indicators what we're doing right now is no longer working and that means that we need to start um, it doesn't mean that we have to start to change our treatment immediately. But we, at the very minimum, need to start thinking about what is coming uh, next, okay? And so, like, what is the, and there's actually very formal criteria that's, why, that's internationally accepted for how we define uh, relapse. Um, and, uh, and so the easiest criteria is 
a clinical progression. So what is a clinical progression? So obviously, if a patient um, has a new um, uh, lytic lesion, which is a hole in the skeleton, um, you know, um, that uh, is obviously uh, a progression because you know there's disease and it's causing illness. Um, and uh, and the CRAB criteria. So let's say you know a patient's um, you know hemoglobin, uh, which is a measure of uh, you know the hemoglobin is a, a measure of the molecule inside red cells. And let's say that um, they were normal, and then they it drops, and the patient's newly anemic. And then you do a bone marrow biopsy, and it turns out that gosh, like you know um, you know their myeloma, uh, which previously was very well controlled, now has uh, grown back in the marrow, right? And that's the explanation for the anemia. And so that's why we could do a complete blood count to see like and track those values over time is this person becoming more anemic what's going on there um you know so we talked about the crab criteria you know high calcium like let's say someone's you know calcium has been normal like because their disease is um, in remission and then all of a sudden their you know calcium is going up and they're you know and they're having issues with low calcium well why is that you know and then they might that may lead us to take a look at their myeloma labs and say hey you know like is it because the myeloma and has progressed um so r is for renal, um, so CRAB, so calcium, R is for renal uh, dysfunction. Um, sometimes if the myeloma relapses, there's a lot of myeloma protein around, it can clog up the kidneys. And so the kidney um, could be injured. Um, and early signs of kidney damage uh, shows up on your labs. And that is why your chemistry is so important when you, when you do your labs. Um, and then we talked, A is the anemia, we talked about that, and the B is the bone lytic lesion. So that is called clinical relapse, where you know the myeloma is changing in such a way that it is like immediately hurting the patient's body. And those are the relapses that we really need to act quickly on um, because we don't want that process to continue to continue to hurt the patient. And ultimately something bad will happen, right? So that's clinical relapse. And then there is a biochemical relapse. Um, and, and, and biochemical relapse is based um, biochemically, basically purely on the, the, the labs. And the labs that, you know, we had talked about, the labs that we said we checked, well, there's actually very specific cutoffs for, you know, for uh, each of those uh, those types of labs. So um, you, in order to interpret those labs, the first thing you must um, know is what is the signature of your myeloma? And when I meet uh, patients that are newly diagnosed, I always tell them, hey, this is your signature because without understanding your signature, you don't really know what you're looking for in the labs. And you know, so that's really important. The most common signature for myeloma patients is an IgG kappa. That's just the most common one, but there's a lot of different ones out there. Like some are IgA, some are lambda, some are kappas, you know? So there's a lot of different signatures out there. So just know your signature. Um, that's the only way to understand uh, your labs um, and not be misled by spurious things that may uh, affect these values, okay? Um, and then let's dive in into the, the nitty gritty in terms of like the actual cutoffs. So for your serum protein electrophoresis, um, this is really when they uh, you know take your blood and they take the serum part, which is essentially the liquid part of your blood and they run it through a gel and uh, they, they look to see if there are any um, proteins. The process of the gel um, is the whole point of the gel is to basically separate pro proteins upon, um, depending on size and charge. And basically what happens is that proteins that are exactly the same, they all line up and they concentrate in one portion of the gel. And that's what myeloma cells do. Like they make, you know, antibodies, um, but they're copies of themselves. So they make the same antibody again and again and again. Anyway, so like, you know, so those antibodies like all accumulate on one portion of that test. And then when they read it, they see the spike. So that, that's why we call it the M, is there an M spike on M protein? Um, and sometimes it does require you to really look carefully because when they result out the um, serum protein electrophoresis, there's a lot of different lines. So you're, what you're looking for is M protein or M spike, okay? And then, um, so they'll give you a value. And let's say, you know, let's say your myeloma has been in remission and that value usually is zero. Um, and then let's say it goes up, um, you know, the next time to like, you know, 0.1. Oh, by the way, there's a companion test called your uh, uh, immunofixation, which is basically they do an additional test on the M spike to see what's the signature. And that is important because, you know, let's say that M spike was zero and now it goes up to like, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 or, or, or whatnot. And the question is, does this bear the signature of your myeloma? 
And that's important because sometimes, you know, let's say someone is an IgG, um, uh, I don't know, like IgA lambda. And then let's say when it came up, it bore a different signature, like an IgG kappa. And when you're like, well, that's not the disease, that's something else that's going on, you know? So that's important. That's why it's important to know your signature. And in terms of the cutoff, so a rise of the M protein, um, if it was zero um, to at least 0.5 um, uh, grams per deciliter, that is the uh, definition of a relapse by an M protein, okay? So we got that. We have a few more to go through. <laughs> Um, so hang in there, bear with me. Um, uh, the other ones that we, the other one we look for is the serum-free light chains. Um, and serum-free light chains is a little tricky. You do have to do a little bit of math. Again, you need to understand what your signature is. So like I said, if you're in um, IgG kappa, then you're looking at mostly the kappa light chains. If you are in IgA lambda, then you're going to focus on the lambda light chain. And you know that the light chains that are um, involved with your disease are called the involved light chains, okay? And so let's say that when you were in remission, uh, and let's say you're, you're, uh, you're, um, you're, you're an IgG uh, kappa, uh, and let's say when you were in remission, uh, your kappa light chains was, I don't know, like 15, you know? Um, and then uh, your lambda, let's say, was like um, 10, just for simple math. So um, so 10 and so 15 and 10, okay? And now you take the difference, actually, this is where the math comes in. You have to take the difference of these two values, which is five, 15 minus five, and then you have to add a hundred to that. So that's 105. And that is, it. so it is when the um, difference in the free light chains um, widens more than a hundred, a uh, hundred points or more. And so you have to take your most recent values and do the subtraction again. So that's, it's a little tricky, you know, um, but, and some people kind of do shortcuts, you know, and as an estimate, because, you know, some people like, it's just sometimes hard to do the, um, the calculation, but technically speaking, that is how you calculate uh, when you meet that criteria by light chains. And also and the third thing is we talked about the immunoglobulins. I like to check the immunoglobulins. Uh, the immunoglobulins uh, include IgG, IgA, and um, uh, IgM. And the reason why I check them is because they're technically not really part of the formal IMWG criteria per se, but there are some people have certain signatures, especially the IgA myelomas have certain signatures that don't show up really well on a serum uh, protein electrophoresis. And so it just gives me an extra, an ID, especially with the ID patients of IgA myeloma, just to give me an idea if they don't show up very well on those tests um, and as another uh, a measure of what's, what's going on. Okay, so those are the, that's obviously in the blood. And obviously if you have a, um, a scan, you know, where you're showing a new lesion, um, that's another criteria. And then last, um, for certainly not least, is the urine studies. And, and the reason why a lot of people don't talk about the urine studies is that, you know, if you were on, for example, a clinical trial, um, for those of you who have participated on a myeloma clinical trial, you'll notice that every month they ask you to do a 24-hour urine. People hate it because you have to keep it in your fridge. And who wants to have a jug of urine like next to the orange juice, right? Um, so, uh, but, you know, um, when you're on a clinical trial, we have to do things by the book. And so we have patients do a 24-hour urine every single month which is not the nicest thing to do and not the easiest thing to do. But, and so then clinical practice, we usually don't ask patients to do that because it's very cumbersome. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's impossible if, you know, for example, if, if a patient is incontinent, for example. Um, so, but technically speaking, if you have a 24 hour urine, um, you know, at, at your best, and then the labs are changing, and then um, you see a rise of the urinary M protein. So they, they do the same thing in the urine as the blood, uh, run it on a gel. Um, and uh, uh, if, if there's a rise of, uh, uh, of um, uh, in that value, then that would also uh, qualify for uh, the criteria for progression. Sorry, that, I know that was a lot, but it is actually a very complicated topic, but I want no. you guys to understand, like, this is what is running through my mind when I see you in clinic. <laughs>
Yeah, no, it's, it's, it really gives the picture of like how much multiple myeloma specialists have to have in their head when they're speaking to the patients. A couple of things that I wanted to address there. One, um, I wanted to clarify one more time about the, um, the ratios, the kappa lambda ratios. So when is it, if, if you're tracking your ratio, when is it um, an area of concern? Yeah, so don't be misled by just the ratio. You do need to look at, at the actual uh, values of the light chains themselves, as well as the ratio. So, um, and so there's essentially with that, within that test, there is essentially several things you look at. The kappa, the lambda, the ratio, and the difference between the kappa and the lambda. So you can't really say, oh, you know, the ratio is like changing, I should be worried. Conversely, sometimes when people, uh, uh, they start to progress, they actually may not have a change in their ratio. And a good example for that is people who, for example, have uh, poor kidney function. Those who have poor kidney function or something's changing with their kidney function, their kappa, the kappa light chains depend on your kidneys for it to be, to, for the body to get rid of it. And if for people who have normal, don't have normal kidneys, that value can just simply, you know, go up as their kidneys lose function. Mm -hmm. So for mm -hmm. example, people with diabetes, you know, where that's not well controlled, that can hurt the kidneys or oh, high blood pressure that's not well controlled, that can hurt the kidneys. Obviously those things are not related to myeloma, but you can see that the kappa goes up over time and you're kind of, and, and the worst thing is that the lambda sometimes does not go up as quick. So then mm -hmm. you start to see the separation and then you start to see the ratio being more and more, you know, um, deranged. And then, you know, folks ask me then, oh my gosh, like, is it, is it because like my myeloma is relapsing? And I was like, well, actually look at your kidney function. That's, that's why. So, but conversely, you can, you can also mis be misled as well, because, you know, let's say you're a Lambda and then, you know, you see that the, the, um, the, the, the Kappa, you know, changing over time. So it's, it, that's what I, the ratio is kind of misleading. You cannot just bank on the ratio. You have to look at the whole picture. Very well said. Thank you. I think this, you know, people ask me all the time, why see a multiple myeloma specialist? And really, truly, if you have to go into this, you know, it's, it's awesome how much, you know, but it's so important that you go to someone that understands this so that, you know, you can get the best care. Thank it's you so, so much. Important. Yeah, it yeah. is so important. And I think that's why I also always encourage like, you know, patients and and you know, to go see a myeloma specialist, to have a myeloma specialist following you, as well as your community uh, provider. In yes. fact, I have a lot of community providers on my cell phone. Um, they can call me, text me anytime because, like, you know, um, I know it's very difficult to interpret these labs, and so it's important to have someone with a trained eye just looking in once in a while to make sure that everything's going the way it is supposed to go. Oh, awesome! I love to hear that kind of coordination happening. <laughs> um, another question to follow up on that. So you talked about clinical relapse. I think you gave a great definition. I often hear, how do I know whether it's my just getting old, my aging, whether it's side effects to a medication or whether it's actually clinical relapse? What is your best advice for patients in that kind of situation? Yeah, that is a great question. So oftentimes, you know, patients who are, um, you know, uh, so my myeloma, um, very commonly people are on maintenance treatment. And with you know, maintenance treatment comes you know, certain side effects. So, you know, for example, you know, if someone is on Revlimid or lenalidomide maintenance and you know, they get increasingly, uh, and you notice, oh, look, they're increasingly anemic. Well, you know, the, the person, the myeloma doc that is you know, supervising the care of that patient will then have to ask themselves, hmm, well, first, you, know, you, want, you want to hold the drug and see what happens. If you hold the drug and the anemia gets better, well, then it's probably because uh, they learn a little bit. Obviously, you have to look at the myeloma numbers right, as well. We right. talked about that. But if the myeloma numbers have not changed, um, then yeah, you, you would, uh, for example, hold the lenalidomide and see what happens, see if it comes back. If it doesn't come back, those are the patients that really would need essentially a bone marrow biopsy to see, you know, has the myeloma relapse, um, you know, in the marrow and this may be changed. Sometimes myeloma changes, you know, over time. Actually, as you journey more and more longer with myeloma, it is, it does change. It is expected that it changes. So there are some patients that, you know, when the uh, relapse happens, um, the myeloma, for whatever reason, doesn't make those light chains as much anymore. Um, so that test becomes a little bit not so sensitive. And then, but you start to see 
like you said, you know, hey, like these, these changes, the patient's coming in feeling more fatigued. They're like, hey, I'm not sure it was aging. I'm not sure it was because of the little lidomide that I'm on. And I see, hey, you're becoming a little bit more anemic. What's going on with that? And then you do a bone marrow biopsy and it turns out the myeloma actually has uh, relapsed. Um, but the labs, it did not reflect in the labs. And, mm -hmm. and as people journey with the disease, you know, myeloma starts to not read the book um, and follow the rules that we, we, we not like a patient in the newly diagnosed setting. Right. Yeah. That's why I think it's so important. I have a lot of patients who are hesitant to call or maybe even embarrassed. Oh, I don't want to bug my doctor, you know, about this side effect. What would be your advice for people? Oh, I don't mean, be I shy. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> Don't be shy. That's what we're here for. Um, you know, that's why we've, you know, we've made things a lot easier for patients to connect. Um, I know at, at UCSF, we, we have my chart, which is uh, a way for patients to just, you know, send us uh, messages. Obviously they're not meant for like, you know, urgent things, but they'll, if you're like, Hey, you know, like I, I notice I'm having these symptoms. Like, can I sit on the visit with my doctor to discuss it? Like that's, you know, I you know we are, we, we want to make sure that the lines of communication are, are open. And a lot of, I think, I think you raise a good point. I think some of my patients are like, gosh, like, you know, like I have cancer and I'm on therapy. Like I'm supposed to feel bad. Yeah. You know, you know, and, and I'm like, actually like with the newer, these newer Asians, you're not supposed to be in bed all the time, you know, you're not supposed to be like not eating at all. Like, you know, it's not, yeah. it's not like, um, some of the, uh, therapies, you know, or, or older drugs that we give for other cancers. Right. Um, yeah. so, so, so yeah, I always tell my patients like, don't be shy, you know, message me, keep the lines of communication open. Yeah, definitely. Awesome point. Thank you. All right. Another question that I had here. So, I mean, the whole topic of today, you know, how fast does myeloma progress? Do we know how fast it can be? I mean, is it, is it day and night that literally overnight, all of a sudden your myeloma could be there? Um, or is there just still more research to be done? So uh, in terms of knowing, I think the answer is yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> yes and no. Yes, in the sense that like we've obviously treated a ton of patients now, you know, and we um, know uh, the different temples you see of uh, myeloma in relapse. Um, and uh, but I think so in terms of the, the temple with which in, in patient relapse, I think we've had a lot of experience with that. In terms of why, I think people are still working on in terms of why and exactly how, you know, and we know a lot, but we still have more to go. And I, I would say, you know, um, the temple really depends on a lot of different things. Uh, where they, when it, where a myeloma patient is in their myeloma journey, um, what kind of risk characteristics does this myeloma patient have? Um, and, uh, and, um, uh, and, you know, there's there are certain things about uh, the, um, the what types of therapies that the patients have been on. I um, mean, so all those things kind of affect, you know, the uh, how rapid or maybe slow um, a myeloma patient um, relapses. Awesome. Let's go a little bit more into that. So you mentioned, you know, different risk stratifications. Does it, if you're high risk, for example, in terms of genetic makeup of your myeloma, Mm -hmm. And maybe we want to clarify for people who are watching and might not know those high risk genetic factors. Does it make you more likely to relapse quicker? Uh, uh, yes, in the sense that when you have been treated, so for, for those who have high risk disease, so high risk disease is defined in, in different ways. You can define it in terms of the, the stage that you're diagnosed in. You can define it, though there are pros and cons of that system. It's no perfect system. Um, and then there's also defining it in terms of the cytogenetic or the genetic uh, abnormalities. Um, you know, classic ones being uh, deletion 17P, um, uh, 414, 1416, 1420, um, uh, amplification 1Q, gain 1Q. That's actually a really long list of them. This is just that's just scratching the surface, uh, but uh, but so so um, so those patients at new at, at diagnosis, they are uh, more likely to not respond as deeply to the therapies that we give them. Though I have to say, with high risk patients, oftentimes not always, oftentimes 
the problem is not that they don't respond. You know, for example, with with Dara RBD, one of the uh, very common induction regimens, the response rates, you know, uh, for all comers is like ninety plus percent is really high. Yeah. Um, and if you do the subset analysis, yes, you see the high risk patients have a little bit of a drop off, but not very not very dramatic actually. But the problem with the high risk um, patients is that it's not that they don't respond; it's just that the response is short, mm. and so that's the problem. And when those high risk patients relapse, do they relapse um, always very quickly? No, that is not true. That is actually not true. You know, high risk patients when they relapse they can relapse slowly. Um, mm -hmm. And then you try to hit them with something else and the response rate for that second regimen um, is lower than your standard risk patients. And even if they re do respond, they're also, that response is also short lived. So, you know, high risk disease, yes, it can um, mean that the relapse is more rapid. Yes, but I would say more often than not, it's actually the temple and this doesn't, it's not necessarily, um, you know, uh, different. It's just that it's just harder to, get back under control and to stay in control. Yeah, that makes total sense. Thank you. You talked a little bit earlier about kidney disease and how it affects the reading of the labs, which makes perfect sense. My question is, what if you have, you talked about diabetes, high blood pressure, you know, even kidney, um, renal, renal disease, do these kind of comorbidities affect the pace of relapsing as well? I don't think it affects necessarily the pace of relapse, but it affects the, the treatments that we select for, for the patient. Um, and that's important because the, for example, if someone has, um, there may be the kidney function isn't so great. Um, they may, uh, the treatments that we give the patient um, they may have more side effects to it. Um, the dose may have to be changed. Um, and sometimes some of the, um, you know, um, uh, a more advanced uh, treatment may be more difficult to, to give uh, for the patient. Um, so it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't really affect the, the um, rapid, rapidity or rapidness of the relapse. It's more like the selection of agents. And obviously being able to have more drugs and a wider selection is better than obviously having a narrower set of drugs. Yeah. Yeah. Makes complete sense. All right. So for people that are in a complete response, you know, this is, this is often where anxiety really sets in every time they go get those labs done. Is this the time that I'm going to, you know, find out and it's not easy, you know, but that being said, without the labs, we wouldn't know. How often do you recommend that people in complete response um, be tested? And what specific tests are, is it those same tests that you mentioned in the beginning that we use for people who are in complete response? Yeah, so for people who are in complete response, it, it also depends. Um, for people who are, um, so I, I'm a, I, I, I offer um, mineral residual disease testing by next generation sequencing for my patients. Um, and I usually, usually I, I ask them like, do you want to know? Uh, MRD testing is essentially a crystal ball for the, into the next couple of years. And some, I'm like, do you want to look in the crystal ball or do you want not want to know? And I have some patients that are like, no, thank you. <laughs> because, you know, I mean, it does require a bone marrow biopsy. And, but a yeah. lot of my patients, like they want to know, they want to see like what the next few years look like really for planning purposes. So mm -hmm. for someone who, for, especially for the, the standard risk patients who are, you know, who are in a stringent complete response, MRD negative, I don't do monthly myeloma labs on them anymore. You know, I, I, I do them, you know, uh, every, and they still obviously need the labs to make sure, you know, they can get their, their relevant and whatnot. Yeah. Um, but the myeloma labs, you really don't really need to tr check them as frequently because the crystal ball, you know, it's actually rather accurate uh, in their MRD negative. And so, um, so I, I, I don't check really, I offer um, that we can check it every other month or even every three months. I would say I offer it, but a lot of my patients are used to just checking it uh, every month and they're like, yeah. I feel better monthly, checking it monthly. I'm like, that's totally fine. That's totally fine. Um, whereas like, you know, for my high risk uh, patients, even if they achieve MRD negativity and they're on maintenance, I still check them off uh, uh, frequently um, because, you know, the MRD negativity in high-risk patients is not as clear as a, not, not clear. The crystal ball is a little outy 
um, yeah. you know, <laughs> are not so accurate. And so that's why I, I, I do continue to, to, um, to check frequently. The other thing I do is uh, I do uh, routinely uh, do um, uh, PET CT scans. You know, it, it, there's a little bit of variation, you know, amongst my aloma docs across the U.S. in terms of that. Um, I, I do, I, depending on the patient, sometimes I check it once a year, sometimes every two years. And some patients, I actually don't really check it much at all, especially those where the myeloma really never manifests with um, uh, lytic disease. I, you know, I really, really just rely on the lab. So it just kind of, for me, it depends on the patient and I, and I tailor it um, depending on uh, who's in front of me. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I can tell why your patients like you. You're a great doctor. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> One of my follow-up questions for that was, was going to be, um, if your patients are worried, do you allow them to treat, like to test more often? And I think your answer was yes. Yeah. I mean, this is all about the patient. It's not about me. I mean, if that provides them that kind of like reassurance, I mean, I think that's fine, you know? Um, so yeah. Awesome. All right. Let's go into like specific almost case studies, if you will. Yeah. Um, give me an example of someone who had a slow relapse and what that looks like regarding whether, when you wanted to start treatment and what kind of, how aggressive you got with the treatment. Yeah, great question. So um, it is not uncommon for patients, like we talked about M protein, it's zero and then it goes up to 0.1. I'm like, you know, and obviously that causes a lot of anxiety, but you know, like, you know what? It hasn't met that definition yet. So let's just keep watching. And it goes up to like, you know, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. And they're like, oh, I'm really nervous now. But it goes up over really long periods of time. And I'm like, okay, you know what? Once it gets to a 0.3-ish or so, like, you know, and like, um, if, and if they have start to have symptoms, especially if that's the symptoms, I would do like, you know, a, a PET CT scan, make sure, make sure nothing is going on, you know, because um, I wouldn't want to be sitting on a new lytic lesion. And, right. uh, you know, but oftentimes like it's, fine and then it goes up to 0.4 you know and like it just it's just happening over the course of like like a couple of years <laughs> so I have seen that you know where it's just really slow in that you know and and then eventually it goes to 0.5 and then I recheck it and it's indeed at 0.5 doesn't mean that I immediately start treatment on the patient no I do however uh, would you know redo their um, PET CT scan, and if there's concerns about you know their labs, I say they're a little bit anemic. I might re redo a bone marrow biopsy, um, and uh, and if they are you know and that bone marrow biopsy, if it's if it shows that the genetics are really just standard risk, it's a conversation. I don't immediately have to change the therapy because um, this this is where the kind of like the gray the the grayness, the art of medicine uh, comes in, um, where for standard risk patients with really no evidence of, um, of clinical uh, progression, it's a discussion with the patient. You know, they may be, you know, oftentimes the question then comes up like, well, what will you switch me to? And like, what what my what will my life look like, you know, on this new treatment? And you kind of weigh the pros and cons of that. Um, different, however, for a patient who um, has high risk uh, disease, in which case I would not wait, I would then, you know, go ahead and, and switch them. Um, so yeah, so that's one temple. Where it's like you know very you know slowly progressive, um, and that's why we use that criteria um, so that because people that rise could could take a long time to actually you know get there, um, but there are other temples that are much more rapid, um, you know where um, there are zero and then like you know the next time you check it is like and they've been zero 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 and then boom it's like 0.4 and you're like well what's going on here is this like a lab error like what's going on you know you check it again it's like you know. Uh, you know, it's 0.7. You're like, oh, like this is actually happening rather quickly. Um, you know, quickly get that PET CT scan, get that bone marrow biopsy. Um, and then if this is so quick and rapid like that, I'm more, much more inclined, even though they're standard risk for biogenetics, much more inclined to go ahead and start, switch them to another treatment. That's so fascinating to me. So let's get into the nitty gritty biology yeah. as much as we know. I mean, you said we don't know why <laughs> exactly, right? I know that we know a lot. There's still a lot more to go. Is it because of different clones? Like, is the person who has a really quick tempo of acceleration in their myeloma, they have a more aggressive clone of myeloma existing in their body versus somebody who's getting those five years of slow progression? Is that, yeah. is that a good way that, to explain that? That is one of the hypotheses. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so, so we know within one myeloma patient, there is multiple clones 
and even you know a diagnosis right and as a patient journeys with the disease like it's like um you 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 treat the patient with induction therapy and let's say you get rid of like you know a lot of these clones but there are some that were constituted a very small percentage of the population those clones then starts to grow are actually resistant to the drug and then those like you know grow up uh, over time and then they those clones is what fuels the 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 next uh, relapse so so and that's actually you know um been um, some studies that kind of you know look at these you know these the changing you know um uh, waves of clones that come about the, the question is did that clone was that clone truly there in the beginning or you know uh, or as the patient progresses those clones will form subclones right you know and, uh, and those subclones actually uh, are essentially those that pick up the new tricks to resist the treatment that we're giving it. Um, you know, so there's these two kind of uh, lines of thought. I think in reality, I probably both things are happening at the same time is my guess, um, you know, because we see that there are genetic changes that, you know, um, didn't seem to be there previously, but are now there. So anyways, it's a hypothesis, I think, you know, right now, um, but that's, these are the prevailing thoughts in terms of, you know, why people relapse. Yeah, it's unfortunate, right? I mean. Myeloma, unfortunately, is so smart, <laughs> just the way that it evolves and the way that it tries to survive. Um, I believe multiple myeloma specialists are smarter <laughs> than the myeloma, and we continue to find, well, we, you guys, continue to find efficacious treatments and new therapies and these immunotherapies, which are just so exciting um, in combination with tried and true regimens. And so, I mean, anyway. our, our collective you know, brain, um, I think has made many, many gains against this disease. Definitely. Um, if you just think about even the past five years, the number of drugs that we have approved for this disease. Um, and, you know, we have essentially um, a drug or two approved per year for this disease, I know, which is amazing, amazing, amazing. right? Um, yeah. So our, our collective brains, you know, yes, myeloma is very smart, um, but we're gaining more and more ground. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And the patients are so well educated and come to webinars like this. So, well, wonderful. It is now time to open the uh, questions up. Um, I've been kind of including some questions of theirs into what we've just talked about, but um, let's, let's get started. So Jean is wondering if you don't have an M spike, what's the best data to look for? Yeah. Um, so it will, you would then, if you don't have an M spike, then you'll look at the light chains and some of these other markers. Um, the tricky question is actually for people, for people who don't have any um, traceable disease by blood or urine, those I think are much trickier. Um, in, those, in those situations, and if they have disease radiographically, then they would need to be monitored episodically by scans. Yeah, that's one of the questions here is, you know, if you're non-secretory, mm -hmm. um, it's not detected, is it harder to identify a relapse? And I would say, unless you're doing pretty regular bone marrow biopsies, the answer would be yes. Is yes. that true? Yes, it is harder because we can't do a scan every single month. That's a lot of radiation to expose a patient to. Um, so uh, those patients are, are a little bit more difficult. There are some, you know, in those patients, I I have tried some tricks up my sleeve, um, which is, you know, I, I try to check their urine sometimes for some reason it's not in the blood. Um, and I and I don't want to do a marrow all the time. You don't really have to do a marrow all the time. Um, I would try to check the urine and, and see if it's there, if I can detect it there. Um, there are other kind of non-conventional um, myeloma markers in some patients, like some myeloma, um, myeloma secrete amylase, uh, which is a type of pancreatic enzyme actually. Um, and anyways, I, I've had like in my career, I've actually uh, seen a couple of patients <laughs> that actually secrete amylase. And I so I just check it just to see if that would be a marker. So there's some other markers that basically you can try checking to see if it follows the course of your disease. Yeah. Another, I, I'm going to ask you about a couple other tests that are used sometimes to monitor myeloma. So one of them is the serum BCMA. Um, are you familiar with that? And what's your opinion on that in monitoring the tempo and progression yeah. of myeloma? 
Great question. So there's a lot of research uh, in BCMA right now, especially with the advent of BCMA directed therapies. Um, you, you see that it's been presented in post form, et cetera, et cetera. But the problem is that it hasn't really come into prime time use because, you know, let's say it's going up. By what level going up? Is it called relapse or going down? But what level? You know, like we haven't really sorted right. that out yet. And, that, and hence, it's not part of the formal IMWG uh, criteria, but unless a lot of exciting research, uh, you know, behind that. And hopefully in the future, it'll be ready for prime time, but not right now. Right. Perfect. Um, let's talk about mass spectrometry. So it is like a more sensitive, uh, you could probably explain this better than me. Um, but it's a more sensitive blood test to determine how much myeloma is, is, is existing in the body. Do you see it? Um, I mean, experts have said it's, you know, five to six years away from us actually using it regularly, even in the clinic. But do you see it eventually one day to replace the SPEP? Yeah, that so this is like very hot right now. Um, and you're <laughs> absolutely right. It's not ready right now for prime time. We are still collecting. So the things that we talked about for the BCMA, same is true for the mass spec. We don't have that kind of granular detail in terms of like, oh, it, it drops by this. What does that mean in terms of response? And not just response, in terms of prognosis, you know, right. what, what does it actually mean? Um, and so we haven't gotten there yet, but it's really exciting. I definitely think it's really exciting because it may obviate the need to do like these moment biopsies in terms of, you know, for prognosis and, and things like that. So um, that I would say, stay tuned. There's a lot more research to be done, not ready for prime time yet. Yeah, the standardization needs a little bit of work. <laughs> and then the coordination between everybody on how they're going to use it. I mean, that's what's yeah. happening with MRD right now as well. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, Joe has a question. What test is used to track M protein in the zero to the 0 0.5 range? Is it the SPEP or what test is used to get those low, low levels of M protein? Mm, so the serum protein electrophoresis is the test that tells you what the M protein is. So the M protein is a result from that test. Um, and, and so, so the M protein um, comes from that test. So yeah. the M protein on that test is, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.5, et cetera. That is the result of the serum protein electrophoresis. Yeah. Um, maybe I'm wrong. Joe, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's just really complicated for people. We hear about these things all the time, M spike, kappa lambda ratio, mm -hmm. et cetera. And yet so many doctors just hand them their labs or put their labs up on my chart. And there's no explanation. There's no... Here's highlighted where you should worry about. Here's highlighted what you should track, you know? And yeah. so it becomes really difficult for patients as they're sifting through their labs, trying to decipher it. I mean, absolutely. Health Tree, yeah. Health Tree Foundation has a patient experience team that's um, trained in this and we have resources on the website. So I'll include these in our follow-up email because I think it's so important that you guys are empowered to understand these labs that are given to you. And I'm sure Dr. Wong, you as an amazing physician can sit down and talk to your patients about, okay, these are what these labs mean. These are what these numbers mean. But unfortunately, especially if you're seeing a community physician, they just don't have the time or maybe sometimes even the knowledge to be able to sit down with you and say, okay, this is exactly what these labs mean, right? No, it's totally, it's so true. I mean, a lot of patients, like they have their, they have access to their labs, but you know, there's no tools that they've been given to analyze it. And I do try to do a lot of teaching. That's why the, my, my patients in the audience you know sometimes I run late because <laughs> I want to, but I really want to make sure that, you know, I empower my patients so that they, they, you know, now that the, they have access to their data and they're looking at it, you know, it's really empowering for them to be have the tools um, to actually understand what they're looking at. But yes, it is com it's complicated, and I, I would I mean I'm obviously you know um, you know trying to tell you what runs through my head when I go through these labs, but but be careful about obviously interpreting it by yourself, right? And that's yeah. why it's important to have a myeloma doc because um, there's other complexities that we haven't even dived into, right? Um, like for example, people who are on daratumumab, like with the, yes. that affects uh, your, your serum protein electrophoresis labs actually. And how do you navigate that? Um, yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, it's, it's good to take your first step at home at trying to decipher and then discussing with your doctor. This is what I think this means. Is that what it means? You know, yes, exactly. kind of having those conversations. Okay. Another question here, Naomi specifically asking, you know, is it of concern if the Kappa free light chain goes up one point per month? I'm going to attach this to another question that I get frequently, which is, should I worry about the quantity or should I worry about the trend? Yeah, you have to worry about both. Um, so you also have to look at your units as well, um, because uh, depending on the, I know this is so com complex, um, you do have to worry, uh, look at the, the units as well. So, you know, uh, is that one uh, gram per deciliter or is that per liter? Um, and that that's that's different. Uh, when I when I talked about the um, 100 is 100 milligrams per liter. Um, so so I, if it's if it's if it's one milligram per, per liter going up, I'm not as, as worried um, as opposed to, you know, if that's actually, um, you know, let's say like, a, 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 it just depends on what your new units are, like a hundred, for example. Um, so it just depends on what your, your units uh, look like. Awesome. Okay. Let's, let's talk about one more time. There are some questions here about what is the criteria for being a high risk patient? Do you mind visiting that one more time? Yeah, absolutely. So high risk could be defined in multiple ways. We, the ones that we had talked about earlier uh, include uh, looking at your staging. So your revised ISS staging, which goes from one, two, three, with three being um, the highest stage, one being the uh, standard risk patients and two being the intermediate. But within the reason why we don't always just look at that is because the limitations with the revised ISS staging is that it uh, does not include, only includes three genetic abnormalities um, and not the whole picture because there are patients that obviously don't may not have those but have something else you know so that's why um uh, and for my patients that actually read my my notes i know you're you're you're, you're there um, you can actually see in my notes i always say what the stage is and then also mention the genetic changes that um, uh, feed into the risk so we talked about how, um, for example, deletion 17P is a very common uh, high-risk um, uh, marker. Uh, gain 1Q is at least intermediate to high risk. There's also amplification uh, 1Q. Uh, there's 414, 1416, uh, 1420. Uh, those are you know, probably the most common uh, ones out there for high risk. Yeah. But, however, on top of that, there is also, uh, since you asked, Let's give you the whole answer, um, uh, which is, you know, there's also functional um, high risk. You know, so there are some patients that by all accounts, it looks like the revised ISS-1, their standard risk, which is great. But then you notice that they went through induction, they got a stem cell transplant, and after a stem cell transplant, um, you know, they relapsed within a year. Whoa. That, and then you do the bone marrow biopsy and then they still look like they're standard risk. I'm like, mm, I don't believe it. This person is not standard risk, right. not behaving right. like standard risk, behaving like a high risk patient. So those patients, we call those patients functionally high risk. Mm. Um, so that's another marker of like a risk as well. So it's, it's a complicated subject, but essentially in a nutshell, um, that's how we think about risk. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, Cindy's wondering here, can small changes in M spike from month to month be due to, no, if I could read, can small changes in your labs be due to the lab versus what's actually happening within your body? Um, with one measurement, possibly. Um, that's why I don't look at just one measurement. And even if you meet the, the criteria for progression, I always repeat it just to make sure it wasn't like a fluke. Um, but trends, I think, uh, tell you a lot, um, you know, so if, if this number has been going up over time, well, it's not, it's not likely that lab is messing it up every single time. <laughs> um, so yeah, so you, you look at the, the actual value, but you also have to look at the trend as well. Um, if, it, if it doesn't make sense, you know, have your doctor repeat it. Okay, awesome. Okay. Um... We have a lot of questions. I want to just thank everybody for your awesome questions. We do have some time left to answer some, but unfortunately we won't get um, to all of them. So I do apologize ahead of time. Um, continuing from the high risk um, standard risk discussion, is it, have you seen when a high risk, an 
an originally high risk patient relapses that they become standard risk or vice versa? Unfortunately, once high risk, it will, the patient will always be high risk. Um, it, the risk does not downgrade. Um, this is a great question. And um, it's an important one because I, you know, um, so when you do subsequent marrows, for example, the sensitivity of the marrows to pick up on the genetic changes really depends on how many myeloma cells are in the sample. So for example, if a high-risk patient just started to, to relapse, you do a bone marrow biopsy, there's very few plasma cells at that time, and then it looks like the genetics are all normal. Can you be reassured that those the high risk uh, genetic that was there is no longer there? No, you you can't. Uh, in fact, so 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 risk is something that uh, yes is assessed periodically, but once you hit a high risk category, you should be thought of as a high risk. Um, have, you should be thought of as having high risk myeloma. Okay, and just to clarify, does the standard risk ever evolve into high risk yes. as myeloma continues? Oh yes, absolutely. Standard risk patients, as you journey longer with this disease, are definitely um, can change their risk profile. Awesome. And hence, that's why we have to do the bone marrow biopsies just to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, several patients here are on DARA, and they're wondering if you could just briefly explain how DARA can affect labs as they're yeah. maybe looking. Is this a relapse or is it DARA? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. That's maintenance a therapy. Yeah, no, this is a really common question. Um, so you have to understand, this is why you need to know the signature of your disease. Ig, IgG kappa is the signature of DARA and DARA can show up on, and not can, it oftentimes show up on your serum protein electrophoresis. So for those, you know, uh, myeloma um, uh, patients who's listening, if you are not, if your myeloma is not an IgG kappa, this does not pertain to you then. Um, because if you have IgA lambda, then you can see on the um, serum proteolectrophoresis, if there's no IgA lambda and this is IgG kappa, you're on DARA, well, that's DARA, right? That's yeah. obvious, right? It's it really, clear, yeah. This problem really, yeah, exactly. This problem really, really applies to facial patients where the signature of the disease is an IgG kappa in which case it bears the same signature as DARA. Um, and sometimes actually may even run in the same portion of the gel as, um, as, as DARA. And so, um, and so there is a way to, you know, kind of get rid of the DARA so you can see what measure, what your, how much uh, disease is there. That's you, that's the myeloma. Um, and, uh, and there is, uh, so, so uh, we call that the, the DARA tumor map uh, immunofixation test. Um, it's a Sendel test. It's a special test um, uh, that needs to be ordered. It's not a part of the routine panel. <laughs> Your doctor actually has to specifically order that test. And actually, recently, there's been a reagent shortage actually for that test for some reason. Um, so we've actually had to uh, re rely on uh, mass spec actually to, um, to substitute in for that. But that's the only way to kind of tell uh, what's the, um, if that's the DARA showing up or is that your myeloma protein? Fascinating. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I learn more every webinar. <laughs> <laughs> um, is a PET scan as good as a bone marrow biopsy and finding progression in your opinion? Um, they are complementary tests. Not one is not necessarily better than the other. They give us um, different pieces of information. Uh, and that's why oftentimes we have to do both. Yeah. What is responsible for creating bone lesions? That uh, is because of the myeloma. So myeloma um, likes to live in the bone. And as it uh, grows, it secretes um, uh, signals, if you will, that breaks down the bone that it's sitting, uh, that's sitting in. So that's how it creates these holes in the bone, both by it essentially, you know, re they, they're growing and then they're also kind of dissolving the bone in that area that they're growing in. And that's why on, on um, x-rays and PET CT scans, you see these holes form. Awesome. Thank you. I'm just writing an answer. Someone was wondering what the 42416, and they're the genetic subtypes or cytogenetics of myeloma, right? The high so risk. 424? The 1420, the... A 1420, yeah, uh-huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
just wanted to make sure I was typing the right thing. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Um, okay. This is a good question. So for people that are regular, so, so back to the stringent, complete response, complete response patients, you said some of them get MRD testing. Some of them do not. Mm -hmm. Do you find that those who stay up to date with their MRD testing usually catch their relapses quicker or is it pretty much the same? Oh, that's a really good question. So I always tell patients, your myeloma labs is what's going on right now. Your MRD testing is meant for prognosis, which is what will happen in the future. So um, those who are MRD positive, uh, I think we're all more vigilant about. We, we scrutinize what's going on uh, a bit more closely. You know, if they have any aches and pains or things that are not explained, our threshold to, to do additional testing is lower because we, knew, we know that that rainy day will come. You know, you just don't know when. Um, I'm not necessarily sure if it necessarily would pick up relapse um, earlier, but we are definitely more vigilant about uh, knowing that you no know, relapse can happen. We know that because the MRD is positive, um, but I'm not sure necessarily sure if it's, it's, it would really catch it earlier. Awesome. Thank you. Such great questions have been asked today. And again, I'm so sorry that we can't get to all of them, but it's just so exciting to see um, how much myeloma research is being done, that there are mm -hmm. physicians like you that care deeply about their patients and want their you know, success as much as they do, um, especially that you're just monitoring, okay, we're not just going to let you go willy nilly. Let's figure out when this is happening. And then there's less pressure where it's not once you, as soon as you see those numbers on the labs, it's time to aggressively treat, you know, I love that you take relationships with your patients one-on-one. -on -one. It's about them and their myeloma, not just you know, trying to defeat and eradicate the myeloma. So thank you for what you're doing. Is there any other closing statements or things that you want to say before we finish up for today? Yeah. So first of all, thank you so much for joining today. I think it's been an awesome discussion. It just reminds me of like a deep dive clinic visit that these are the conversations I have with my, you know, patients, like, you know, every, every time uh, we meet, I think the take home message today is, um, you know, I've given you some of the tools to uh, uh, look at your labs and interpret your labs. Um, but you know, it's important to also review this with your with your doctor, um, your your my, and your myeloma specialist, um, just to make sure that as you can tell, the interpretation can be complex. Um, just to make sure that uh, you know that you're on the same page, and on, at the same time, it also creates dialogue with that you know with that doctor as well. Um, in the era of the information age, you know, it's you know tempting to be like, hey, I'm just gonna look at my labs, like and everything like looks great, but, 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 you know, it's important to engage, you know, with your myeloma doctor kind of, and, and sometimes, you know, I, I reassure patients, um, and, but as we're interpreting the labs together, there are questions that, that come up like, Hey, you know, like, you know, what if this happens, et cetera. And then, you know, and, and so that kind of always segues into like, you know, planning for the future, what are some of the new things that are happening? So do engage with your myeloma doctor about, um, you know, about these important points. And I'm just so glad that, you know, you guys were able to join us today uh, for this really awesome uh, a webinar slash somewhat podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Wong. We really do appreciate you. And I hope that you have a great rest of your day. Um, to my thank community, you too. Thanks. Uh, to my community, I'll just finish up with a couple of outro announcements. I also wanted to um, let you know, several of you did not get your questions asked, but we have a medical professional team at the Health Tree Foundation. They cannot give specific medical advice, but a lot of the questions that you ask that did not get answered can get answers. So I'll make sure to include the link to setting up an appointment with them um, in our follow-up email. You will need to create a Health Tree Care Hub profile so that they can give you accurate information, um, but they're here to help. We're willing to help. So again, I will include that information as I send out this recording in an email to each of you. Um, join us. We meet every other month, so join us in June. We're going to be talking about um, target markers like GPRC5D, FCRHS, I mean, five, see my mind, like can't read those. Like I can say them in my head, but like saying them out loud, 
Anyway, there are different markers apart from BCMA that multiple myeloma specialists and um, drug companies are working to develop um, therapies that can treat other targets on the myeloma cells. So it's really exciting. And I want you to learn more about the upcoming therapies that are going to be existing in the myeloma field. We do have a group online where you can connect with other relapsed refractory myeloma patients and caregivers in between our bi-monthly meetings. And I will include that link as well as in our follow-up email. Um, just a reminder to take a survey as you log off today. It really helps me. The 25th at 2 p.m., you can join us. We're going to be hearing about different types of clinical trials with Dr. Craig Cole. That night is our Florida myeloma chapter. We're going to be talking about practicing mindfulness. And then on the 26th at 1 p.m. Eastern is our minimal residual disease chapter. And we're going to be hearing about the immunopet um, test, which is in clinical trials right now. It's extremely fascinating. It's a more sensitive PET scan that can determine how much myeloma is really existing in the body as a companion to um, uh, mi standard minimal residual disease testing that we have today. So um, come learn about that. And even more events that I haven't mentioned are available to register for on our website. Um, Amgen, Abvi, Adaptive Biotechnologies, Janssen Oncology, Genentech, and Bristol Myers Squibb are our sponsors, and we're grateful to them. A big thank you to each of you for helping us build this myeloma community. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and thank you all for taking the time to be here. I hope you learned something. Take care, everyone. Bye bye.